Right, you have to. Welcome, Una. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I was late. I'm sorry I burst in. I thought I was coming in the back of the room. So um, there you go. I'm terribly sorry about that. We pre warned them that you might stop oh. That wasn't Nobody a sneak, anything. was it? <laughs> Nobody saw anything. You're fine. Welcome. Thank Over you very you. much. Sorry, trains, but I think I don't. We all know what that's like. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak with you today about patient safety and wound care. Um, uh, this morning, my husband said, "So where are you off to today?" I said, "I'm off to talk about safety." And he looked at me and said, "What seat belts and fire extinguishers?" And he looked at me. And he looked, so I said, "No, not that sort of safety. No, we're looking about wound care and safety." So, so we go. Thank you very much for your earlier talk, and as you say, I'm going to be citing some of um, the similar evidence, although I will say with the Julian Guest data, I mean, it's as good as we've got, but there are large margins, margins of uncertainty around there, and I'll explain why that's the case. But you can see from this, oh, I can look up there, can't I? You can see from this slide here that the bits in red, if it's a bit smaller print, but the, the one below is what the guest figures were in, I think it was 2014 15, around then. And the next one is the um, 2017 18, which just shows you how fast it's grown. And we can only assume it's got significantly worse during COVID. That's certainly what we're hearing from the ground. So if you look at it compared to these other things, it's, it's about, in fact, it's bigger. <laughs> There's an irony, it's bigger than obesity. Um, it's getting on the way to some of these other top, I mean, we know diabetes is a huge problem, but it, this is a really big problem for the NHS and it has been so neglected and frankly continues to be neglected. Doesn't get the attention it should, so I'm very glad you're here today. Um, we were commissioned by NHS England in 2018 to address the problem of wound care, suboptimal care, wound care. We are asked to look at lower limb care, pressure ulcers and surgical wounds. I'm only going to focus on um, pressure ulcers and surgical wounds today because that's what I've been asked to speak on. Though I will throw in about lower limb every now and then because I cannot miss an opportunity to raise your awareness about that problem which dwarfs the others frankly. So, in 2019, you got the National Patient Safety Strategy published and also the long-term plan, which at that point, we were dribbling along on a tiny, tiny budget and we went up a little bit. So, God bless the long-term plan. So, I'm going to talk about the two issues of concern, as I said, to NHS England at the moment are pressure ulcers and surgical site infection. Now, I did allude to already, and I promise this might be the last time I speak about it, unless you ask me in the Q&A, but um, suboptimal leg and foot ulcer care has not been recognised by NHS England as a safety issue, despite being five times more common than pressure ulcers, and three times more common than surgical wound complications, and I would hazard guess far less well managed than either of those two. Frankly, I'm just gobsmacked nobody's brought legal cases against people for the issue with leg ulcer wounds. It constitutes, like lower limb, 75% of the total wound spend on wound care, but it's not a safety issue. But I'll leave it there, shall I? In case for my passion on that one, I think we're missing a trick there. So let's see if we can do something about it. Right, back to what I've been asked to speak about. <laughs> <laughs> Pressure ulcers, which I've had a lot of attention. I think a lot of you in the room will know they're un unwanted, and it says often avoidable. I say nearly always avoidable. At one point, they said they were always avoidable. They're not. If you've got somebody who's dying, the last few days of life, they start to shut down. Things break down. It happens. But those are the rare exceptions. And of course, if somebody's had a stroke and has been lying on the floor for 24 hours because they were my age, fit and well before that, nobody expected them to be fragile, you will get those. But put those aside. The rest are, are nearly always preventable. They've been a focus of quality improvement for some years, right back to 93. God, that's 30 years, isn't it? Um, they were a key quality indicator there. They were included in the QUIT program in 2010. 2011 had the initial stop the pressure ulcer. You, some of you will remember the safety thermometer, national safety thermometer, and the dreaded incident reporting systems, which I will say a little more in a while. And then the um, Stop the Pressure program became a national program in 2016, but it was paused in 2020 because of COVID, obviously. And then in 2022, it was agreed that the Stop the Pressure work would become aligned with the National Wind Care Strategy program, which, which made some sense. Um, and then if we look at surgical site infection, again, an unwanted and often avoidable complication of care, often, again, not always. Um, 
But the picture about surgical site infection and wound breakdown is unclear. Now, if we exclude those whose surgical wounds healed within four weeks, which we'd say was normal healing, um, then around 11% of wound care is due, to, um, is due to surgical site complications. Let's call them complications. And that is probably predominantly due to surgical site infection or dehiscence. Dehiscence doesn't get mentioned, but I'm a district nurse by background, and I know dehissed wounds, wounds that break down, are a huge problem, but they don't count as far as SSI, and that is a problem, we think. So we need to sort out that out. Um, most surgery, obviously, most of it occurs in acute care, obviously, but nearly half the NHS cost of care is incurred in community, that's 48% relating to surgical site infection, nearly half of it is incurred outside hospital, and it's pretty much invisible because nobody really collects data, as far as we can tell, on that. So we've got a big hidden problem here. But out of interest, who is a district nurse in the, or has a background in community nursing? Do you recognise what I'm saying? Yeah, it all comes out, doesn't it? We end up... You know, dealing with that. So at the moment, there's two national surgical wound surveillance systems. There's the, I have to get this right now, it was Public Health England, it's the UK Health Security Agency Surgical Site Infection Surveillance System. That rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> have I got that right? Yeah. <laughs> um, it only seeks information on surgical site infection. Can I refer to them as SSI? If I say SSI, we all know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, not wound breakdown or other surgical wound complications such as bleeding. So it's only SSI. It's only mandatory for orthopaedics, and it's optional surveillance and for, for other specialities. And then you've got the GERFT programme, which again is an excellent programme, but it doesn't cover it all, it's voluntary. So let's come on to the NHS Safety Division. I'm guessing someone's already presented on this this morning. Um, and uh, as far as I can tell, there are three key areas. There's insight, so which is about data, information, it's all very well saying data, but unless you can get information out of the data, it's not much use. Um, so we're looking at understanding what's going on, that intelligence. We're looking at involvement, patients, staff and partners to know what they're doing and do the right thing. And improvement, having the systems of change that means we can do improvement in a meaningful way. So let's have a look at it from wound care. Well, we have got problems. If we look at insight, um, I, said, I put there lack of wound care data. I really should change that. Actually, we've got quite a bit of wound care data, but it makes we can't make any sense of it. I mean, when I first started in district nursing, which was, oh, God, late 80s, early 90s, so some time away, I was given this list of handheld thing. I had to put all that information. Some of you may, may be old enough to remember that. And I know you're still putting information. You have to write it in your notes. It doesn't go anywhere. Okay, it's only use for you as clinicians. Very little of that is drawn through in a meaningful way. So we have a real problem. We don't actually know what's going on. If I look at involvement, we know that the vast majority of people caring for people with wounds do not have adequate knowledge and skills to look after wounds properly. I mean, I mean most, obviously I would hope most tissue viability nurses do, but they're a tiny number of the clinical population. If you talk to most clinicians, have something to do with a wound, whether it's a GP, just somebody comes in with a gash in their leg, or um, you know, or a, um, even a um, oh gosh, can't think of their names. Um, a physio will say somebody, oh, I did this. A lot of clinicians, paramedics, have involvement with wounds, and they don't get taught about it. Nurses, nurses do the most. They don't get enough in their pre-reg, if any. I was quite shocked when I became a lecture, lecturer. How little they get. And we also have a problem with patients and carers. Um, a friend of mine was discharged from hospital following surgery and had a bleed. Unfortunately, I was cooking a very complicated Sunday lunch, so I didn't spot she'd wrong me. So she ends up spending five hours in A&E that actually, had she been given the right information, she could have managed that herself. I would have helped her had I, had I picked up the call, but life's like, and it shouldn't be down to me as a friend. She should have been discharged with the right information. And then we've got the problem of poorly organised care, which leads to unwarranted variation, underuse of evidence-based care and overuse of ineffective interventions. And no disrespect to my previous speaker, dressings are really important, but they don't usually heal a wound. You can cause harm with a dressing if you get it wrong, <laughs> but they're not the solution. They are part of the solution. So we tend to focus too much on dressings and we don't focus enough on the actual things that make a real clinical difference. So we need to do something about this. So let's go through it bit by bit. How am I doing time-wise? OK. Um, insight. Um, this is about the information. The current systems used to monitor pressure ulcer patient care lack standardisations. They're characterised by high levels. They, um, 
of, of, um, they've, of under-reporting. Not enough information makes it in there in the first place. And you cannot do quality improvement unless you've got good quality information to work on. And frankly, at the moment, pressure ulcer information is still incomplete and unreliable. Um, the current systems used to um, monitor pressure ulcer patient harm, they lack standardisation and they're characterised, as I said, by high levels of underreporting. The improvement targets are too often unrealistic and have often in the past been unfairly used to compare and sometimes financially penalise trust for underachievement. And yet we know this is unreliable data. We've got a big problem here. This has led to, not surprisingly, if you're getting punished, you're going to try and work out how you can do something about this. So we've ended up with unhelpful variation in interpretation and um, gaming of the system. People will choose to interpret in the way they can to minimise the penalties they're going to incur. It's just not good enough. And despite um, clinical incident reporting, I mean incident as opposed to incidents or prevalence, too many organisations still rely on clinical incident reporting. It is not suitable for monitoring what's going on at the pressure ulcer, um, what's happening with pressure ulcers in your organisations. So we, it, what we should be doing is implementing the learning. But what clinicians tell me over and over again is that actually they're just learning the same stuff. It's the same problem, but there's not enough attention being paid to doing something about changing, changing what the problem is. So we've got a problem. Let's have a look at surgical site infections. Again, we've got a very incomplete picture. As I said earlier, most systems are voluntary. They only focus on surgical site infection, not wound breakdown as a whole, and there's a lot of that. And they rely either on hospital reporting or patient self-reporting. And even if it's hospital reporting, very often it's junior members of the team. And frankly, diagnosing surgical site infection is not always a straightforward thing to do. I can look, I mean, I've been doing this a long time, and I can look at a wound and, yes, it's broken down. Is it infected or not? Sometimes it's really obvious, but very often it's not. So we need to do something about that. So it's incomplete, inaccurate, and it misses community and general practice where so often things happen, particularly as patients are being discharged earlier. So we need to improve our metrics. We need national metrics to support improvement. And we strongly believe that data collection should be secondary to operational practice. What we mean by that is when you, as a clinician, put something into the clinical record, it should be done in a way that is automatically coded and uplifted to your systems above. No one has got time to go around doing audits. And the, data, the digital technology is there to do this now. We're just not doing it, or we're not, our organisations are not embracing it. And if we did, we would get so much better, such better quality information. And then that data will feed into the existing national system, such as the model health system, which includes the model, health, the model hospital. So in other words, you're not having to go around doing extra audits or extra bits of information. You just put it in the right place, in the right way. It gets coded. It gets pulled through. Wouldn't that be nice? So what have we done to try and help this away? As you can hear, we are a very small team. We are very passionate about what we, what we do. And we're told we are ahead of the game. So NHS England are paying some attention to us because it turns out we might be a good guinea pig. But what we have done is we've already published a what we, we've called a functional overview for wound management data systems. So if you think this is a good idea and your organisation isn't doing this yet, go and have a look at our website and download this document because it tells you what your organisation should be looking at, what's needed for wound management in your organisation. To be honest, most of what we say is also needed for other, other disease processes. So go and have a look for that. We also have published recommendations for the use of digital images in wound care. I know you alluded to this. It's so useful to have a picture of a wound. Wound care is very visual. You really need those images. And what's brilliant is you don't just need one image, you need a series so you can tell where you're going. So we again talk about that. And again, that goes back to our functional overview, which gives some clues. We've also, um, we are so proud of this, though I understand it very little, um, we have just got published a draft NHS wound management standard, 
I'm not even going to read the letters if you want to go looking for it. And again, I hope my slides will be available afterwards. This is the standard that all your IT geeks in your organisation should now be working to. So we now have a shared understanding. All this is on our website, by the way. And if you need to just, go if, you, if you lose the slides, never get it. Just Google Nat Wound Strat, National Wound Care Strategy Programme. You'll find everything there. Um, and we are now working with NHS Digital to introduce an information standards notice. And that means organisations will say they have to collect their data in this way. Um, it's somewhat confusing for those of us who are clinicians, but those of us who are digital data geeks have welcomed this with open arms because it standardises, and that's what we need. So that's out there now for you. Um, if we move on to involvement, this is about knowledge. Um, back in 2018, we realised that they just the NHS did, workforce did not have adequate knowledge and skills, and we were dependent on companies like Smith and Nephew to educate our workforce, which, while was very kind of you, wasn't right. We should be educating our own workforce properly. So we worked with what was Health Education England to develop free-to-access online wound care education resources. They're multi-purpose, sorry, multi-level, um, so they're suitable for a... I don't know, a dermatology consultant who might decide he actually he or, that he or she needs to know a bit more about pressure ulcers. Or, um, or um, a, a healthcare assistant who's new into things and is trying to get their head around. We have tier one, tier two. But they are there. We are praying the universities will pick them up. If you have links with your local universities, tell them about this. If you're a clinician in practice and you've got a student attached to you for two weeks, you know those days when you just think, what am I going to do with this student? Get them doing some of our online resources. You know, it's... Um, they're there, medical students, whatever. They are there, they get rave reviews, and they are free to access. We're told they're very, people like them. Please use them. We also developed a capabilities framework, again, multi-professional, multi-level, to say what capabilities should people who come into contact with people with wounds have, um, health, and care, health and care professionals. And we are just about to publish the update of that, which is the same framework for those of you who have been using it, you'll be relieved, but we've added some extra information around it to make it more user friendly. And then we come on to improvement. Um, we need to improve the systems of care. So we've written recommendations. It turns out that's the really easy bit. Writing the recommendations, what people should do, is the e relatively easy bit. We are about to publish the pressure ulcer ones any day. I was reading some of the draft on the way down. And the surgical wounds ones we hope to publish in the new year. Implementing them is much more challenging. So, with pressure ulcers, we have, um, in response to the refresh of the National Patient Safety Strategy, we have created the Pressure Ulcer Improvement and Coordination Group, which is a collaboration between ourselves as the National Wound Care Strategy Programme, <coughs> NHS England's Nursing Director, who have always had an interest particularly in the pressure ulcer work, and the NHS England National Patient Safety Team. And we've submitted a bid to fund a quality improvement programme for pressure ulcers, uh, which will have a two to three year framework. We're in the diagnostic stage at the moment. We've just recruited two organisations to work with us, two provider organisations to work with us, to inform the co-design and development of the improvement programme. And then we plan to take that forward. This um, across the next two to three years, working much more broadly with a much wider group of people. For those of you who've had the nightmare of trying to make sense of collecting pressure ulcer information and have been punished by your various boards because they don't like what they see, I hope this will be so welcome to you. Um, I hope we get funding for this. That is the big problem. We are a tiny program. We are due to, we've already had our funding cut for this year by 37%, which is huge. I don't, think, I don't know why that hasn't hit the press, but they're not asked program personally, but the huge cuts. So we are still making this a priority, but we will need funding centrally to be able to carry this out. So we're praying that comes through. The signs are good at the moment, um, but assuming that will, because it is supposed to be an NHS England safety initiative, you would hope they would fund this. Hopefully that will be what the future holds, and you'll hear more about that as we move forward. In the meantime, there is a lot of information on our website about pressure ulcers if you want to understand more. Surgical wounds, frankly, are a bit more open. So because of the sheer volume, we felt we had to prioritise our lower limb work because it was so huge and so neglected. We are about, we hope to um, update our recommendations, but also because there are already partners in the field, um, like the what was um, 
the, the um, oh God, what was it called? I can't remember the name now. The new NHS England patient safety, oh God, what's it called? UK Health Security Agency <laughs> side, because we've got those and we've got our partners with GERFT, we know we're going to have to work collaboratively. And our hope is that those two organisations will communicate with each other and us, and maybe we can do something similar in a collaborative way. We've all been through a very tricky time the last three or four years. It's not surprising things have been difficult, and quite rightly, COVID needed to take priority. But we can't just ignore this. We've got to do something about it. So in the meantime, between now and March 25, we will do as much as we can with um, the resources we've got to get things ready to move forward with improving how surgical wound co people with surgical wound complications, the care they receive. And that's it. Oh, bang on time. <laughs> <laughs>